I'm Kate Bond. I'm the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of Research at IWPR. So I lead our fantastic team of experts and researchers who are doing the hard work every day of building evidence that are used by policymaker and advocates to actually make change. And I'm proud of the work done by my research team, but I also know it takes those policymakers, um, like those that we're hearing from today, and it takes those real lived stories to connect this research to actually making change. Um, so you know, I really believe that research is in service of narrative change, and we're really following the work that you all do today. We have many great sessions left this morning, but up next is a conversation between my boss, Dr. Jamila K. Taylor, and Delaware State Senator Sarah McBride. As most of you know, Sarah McBride is a groundbreaking leader on gender issues, and we'll hear from her on why representation matters as we continue to shape a better world for women everywhere. Um, I also had the pleasure of working with Sarah many years ago at the Center for American Progress when I also first worked with Jamila, and I could tell even back then as a young woman that she would become the inspiring leader she is today who's bringing her lived experience to actually driving change in this country. The senator could not be with us in person, um, but she was kind enough to record a brief conversation with Jamila a few days ago, so let's tune in. I'm thrilled to welcome Delaware State Senator Sarah McBride to the Power Plus Summit. Senator McBride is a true progressive leader, one who talks the talk and has the courage to actually walk the walk. She's the first openly transgender person elected to state senate and in that role has been instrumental in advancing true policy change for women and families in the state of Delaware. Senator McBride continues to break barriers and chart new ground while leading the fight on issues we all care so deeply about. I had the pleasure of working with Senator McBride at the Center for American Progress years ago, and I'm so delighted that she's taking time out of her busy schedule to join us today. Senator McBride, I know the crowd in Chicago is eager to hear your perspective on these issues. Let's dive right in. As I mentioned in the introduction, I had the pleasure of working with you at the Center for American Progress years ago. And I was always so impressed, not only with how adept you are on the policy issues, but also your passion for public service. Tell us more about your path to leadership and public service. It's, it's great to join you today. In many ways, my journey to public office, my, my journey to uh, government, in so many ways for me has been a, a journey back to hope. When I was a, a young person buried deep in the closet, I was scared, I was alone, and I feared that our politics just couldn't work for someone like me. And I faced, I think like so many young people across this country, a crisis of hope. And in that crisis of hope, I went searching for solutions. I went searching for examples of our world becoming kinder and more just and more inclusive. And I found a little glimmer of hope as I stumbled across the history books in my elementary school library, because I saw that the through line of every chapter was a story of advocates, activists, and a handful of courageous elected officials working together to right the wrongs of our past, to address injustice, to bring people from the shadows and the margins of society into the circle of opportunity. And I found hope in that story. I found hope in the possibilities in our politics. And so I got involved. I had the opportunity to work for our former governor, Jack Markell, for our former attorney general, the late Bo Biden. I had the opportunity to work with you at the Center for American Progress, eventually uh, became the national spokesperson at the Human Rights Campaign, and then later ran for and won the state Senate seat that I was born and raised in here in Delaware. And throughout all of that experience, it's been a journey back to hope because I've had an opportunity to have a front row seat to change that once seemed so impossible to me as a kid that it was almost incomprehensible to see that change become not only possible, but a reality, not just on issues of, of LGBTQ rights, but here in the Delaware General Assembly on issues like paid family and medical leave and child care and health care and gun safety, reproductive freedom on so many issues that I and so many others are passionate about. Thank you so much, Senator. You know, as I mentioned in the intro and as you mentioned as well, um, you know, you are the first openly transgender state senator in the country, as well as the highest ranking transgender elected official in U.S. history. What does representation in legislators mean to you? Why does it matter? Well, 
you know, for me, the, the most formative identity, the most formative experience that I bring to my, my time in the Delaware General Assembly is actually not my identity as a trans person. It was my experience serving as a caregiver to, to my husband, Andy, during his battle with cancer. And all of these experiences come together to, to make me the person that I am, to inform my, my perspectives and priorities. Um, and, and that, of course, includes my trans identity. I'm so proud of who I am. I'm proud to be trans. I'm proud that this state of neighbors time and time again has demonstrated that there is room at the table for all of us, certainly at least more and more of us, and, and eventually, hopefully, all of us. Um, but what I have seen firsthand, both as an advocate and as an elected official, is that diversity in government is not a, a luxury, and it's not just symbolic. It has a substantive impact because you can't craft effective solutions for a diverse community, a diverse country, if you don't have the full diversity at the table. That's true in, in politics, it's true in public policy, it's true in technology, it's true in business, it's true across the board. So we have to have our voices at the table to change uh, and inform policy discussions, to change and inform priorities, to change and inform our politics, because at a minimum, it is more difficult to hate up close. It is more difficult to attack a community that you have to look in the eye and explain your policies to. Senator McBride, so many of the policy initiatives that you have led on are also priorities for IWPR. You introduced the Healthy Delaware Families Act, a bill that created a statewide paid family medical leave program. You've also worked to pass legislation to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage for new moms up to one year support coverage of abortion care through the Medicaid program and private insurers and work to boost quality affordable child care. Just a really stellar record supporting these issues that are central to the health and well-being of women and families in this country. These are also policy issues that we have yet to fully realize at the national level. How do you see them playing out moving forward? Well, I'm certainly proud of what we've been able to do here in Delaware, and those were priorities that were rooted in, in my own experiences, but they were also rooted in the needs that I was hearing from my neighbors as I knocked on doors running for state Senate in 2019 and 2020. They're the needs that I have heard throughout my time in the state Senate. There are needs that I continue to hear in, in new capacities. But they're also more, more broadly really at the heart of our economic future as a country, because the reality is, is we have a 1950s care infrastructure for a 2024 workforce. And so we need at the state and federal level policies that remove barriers to full participation in our workforce, that improve outcomes for children, that allow everyone in our society to meet their needs uh, to their own health and to their families while also pursuing their passions and their dreams professionally and allow for our economy to tap the talent and potential of everyone. And so while we can do a lot at the state level, ultimately we need federal action on paid family and medical leave, on child care and early childhood education. I think what we've seen over the last 30 years is a trend. In the 90s, um, President Clinton pushed forward healthcare reform, but it didn't make it over the finish line. And so in, 20, in 2009 and 2010, that Congress picked those uh, policies up and passed the Affordable Care Act. That same Congress, they weren't able to pass um, uh, cap and trade. And so in 2021 and 2022, that Congress picked up those pieces and passed the Inflation Reduction Act to address climate change. But of course, the IRA was whittled down from Build Back Better, which included a number of the policies we've talked about paid family and medical leave, child care, housing, elder care, home care, a lot of these investments and policies that working people desperately need, particularly women in our economy desperately need. And those pieces fell to the negotiating room floor. And so it's my hope that come 2025, we pick up those policies from the Build Back Better negotiating room floor and prioritize them in the tradition of, of previous Congresses picking up the unfinished work of an earlier Congress to put them at the top of the priority list. We still don't have nearly enough representation for women and young people, people of color, as well as those from the LGBTQ plus community in the halls of legislatures across the country, including at the national level. What are your hopes for representation in the future? Well, 
my hope is that uh, diversity becomes such a norm that it's no longer newsworthy. Uh, you, you know, I, I understand why there is a lot of attention when we break glass ceilings, when we shatter lavender glass ceilings, when we break barriers and, and ensure that more diversity in government uh, exists. A and that is an advancement that is worthy of being celebrated. It is an advancement that young people of all different backgrounds deserve and need to see. It could be life-saving for someone. I know how much of a difference it would have been, it would have made for me as a young person to see someone like me run and win uh, elected office. But ultimately, the, the, the hope is that this is such a norm and that diversity is so commonplace that it's not a headline when a, a trans candidate gets elected, when we elect a woman uh, or a person of color to the highest office in the land, when we, when we shatter these glass ceilings and break these barriers. Uh, that's my hope for the future, that the United States government uh, always looks like the country that it seeks to serve, that it always includes all of our voices from every single background. Because again, not only will that help to send a, an important message that the heart of this country is indeed big enough to love all of us, not just that all of us can fully and equally participate in this democracy, but I truly believe we will get better policy outcomes when the full range of our country's lived experiences are represented at the table. Senator McBride, you continue to inspire so many of us working in social justice spaces. And I really wanna thank you for all you do and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me today in conversation for the 2024 Power Plus Summit. Well, thank you. And thank you for all of the work that you are doing to ensure that vision of America is realized for all of us.